Okay, hi everyone. Uh, again, this is uh, my name is Natalie, and uh, today I'll be talking to you about uh, electron energy law spectroscopy. Um, so, just a mm, brief overview of this presentation. Okay, there we go. Um, so, I'll just kind of go over you know, what is EOS and how do we generate this signal in the transmission electron microscope? I'll go over a little bit about the spectrometer, uh, parts of the spectra, and how to process the data, which is probably, arguably, one of them just as important as acquisition. So, I'd like to start off um, by giving you some helpful resources. Um, these are very, very good resources and books, and uh, we have a website here. Um, so it's where I gathered a lot of the material that I'm showing you today. I would say this is like your EELS Bible right here. Um, there's so much more information that's in there than what I'm going to be presenting to you today. So if you have any um, further I guess inquiries, I would highly recommend uh, you uh, refer to this book. Um, this book is your classic uh, Williams and Carter uh, book. Um, you have the basics, I'll just kind of introduce you to the technique without the complicated math. Um, so if you're new to the technique, I would suggest that. And also um, another resource I think is really helpful for um, your medium uh, EELS uh, user would probably be this uh, website by Gatan. It's just eels.info. And uh, in there, you can find information about everything. It's very, very helpful. Um, and it's, you know, populated with a lot of helpful resources. So I highly uh, recommend that you guys check those out. Okay, so as, as Sam was saying, um, EELS is the ener electron energy law spectroscopy. And basically, you're um, going to be looking at the forward inelastically scattered electrons. Um, so that takes place in the transmission electron microscope, which we have here. Um, and uh, you have your sample here, which is irradiated with your electron beam and when that happens uh, you can get it generates a lot of um, signals so you can get Auger, uh, capital luminescence, uh, backscattered electrons, you can get x-rays, secondary electrons um, and then you also have scattering. So the main thing or the uh, what we're going to be talking about today is collecting uh, these electrons, which are the four scattered electrons. They've traveled through the sample and um, have been scattered at a certain angle. And they're going to be collected in your uh, spectrometer. And so uh, shown here as an example. And so you can get a lot of uh, different information from this technique. Um, it's kind of listed here. Uh, from the book is uh, you can get a lot of you can you can t look at the you know your sample thickness um, you can do mapping you can uh, look at the plasmons you can um, you know get bonding information oxidation states um, a lots of different information and these are the alternative methods for getting them so one thing I would like to point out that is that EELS is very similar to X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So a lot of the uh, processing, data processing, and kind of the spectra looks very similar, except that in X-ray absorption spectroscopy, the signal is uh, instead of your incident beam being electrons, it's going to be X-rays. So it's kind of like the same thing. So if you're kind of familiar with that, um, you're already familiar with EELS. So, before we start, uh, just an overview of the tech EELS at CCEM. So, we have three TEM microscopes uh, that can uh, 
we can use for this technique, acquisition of this uh, data. Uh, we have the titans, the two titans. Um, one is uh, equipped with a quantum GIF. Um, it has a CCD and a direct electron uh, detector. The Titan low base has a tritium GIF and it has a CCD detector and our newly installed Talos 200X, which has a continuum S spectrometer and uh, it's equipped with a CMOS detector. So, EELS is very helpful for uh, materials characterization. And just here are just a few uh, examples from our facility. Um, a lot of them, if, you, if you're familiar with EELS, you know, you'll see um, a lot of elemental mapping, but EELS is, can be a lot more than that. You know, you can probe, um, you know, the plasmons, uh, as I said, well, wait a minute. Oh, there it is. Here it is. Okay. Um, plasmons uh, to look at help improve the design of nanoprotonic devices. Um, you know, mapping and like elemental mapping. So this is done in like lithium uh, battery materials. Um, you can use it to understand uh, nuclear reactor materials, which is what they did in this uh, study. So looking at the uh, Elemental distribution of helium bubbles in this material. And then you can also look at, you know, you can also map out orbitals, which is kind of crazy, um, to just better understand material properties. Just a few examples. So, okay. Um, EOS is very similar or it's very complementary to EDS in that you can get uh, elemental information and you can perform quantification uh, to understand the composition of your material. Um, one thing I'd just like to point out is that EELS is a primary process. So you're looking at the energy loss from the uh, primary beam. The, and uh, EDS is a secondary um, technique in which the electrons interact with their sample, uh, they get excited, and then the decay uh, is uh, released, or sorry, the um, decay from the excited electron uh, releases an X-ray. And so that's a secondary process. And so uh, one advantage over EEL, uh, EDS is that you have, uh, you're probing a smaller region. So you can have a lot of other scattering uh, events uh, that happen that produces an X-ray um, that can uh, produce, uh, contribute to your X-ray signal. And uh, since we're dealing with uh, really fast electrons, they transmit through your sample. So your probe, your in the size of your incoming probe uh, you have a little bit of broadening here, um, but the region probed by X-rays is, is a lot larger. So it's it can be a little bit, you have a little bit of increase in spatial resolution um, as well as energy resolution. So shown here in which you have a EDX spectra versus the EOS spectra. And so you can see that the resolution of these peaks um, is greatly increased uh, by using EELS, and that's due to, to the spectrometer. So we can talk a little bit about that. So um, as I said, uh, EELS collects uh, inelastically scattered electrons. So what does that exactly mean? So you have your beam here. It's going to interact with the atomic orbitals, the electron, electronic atomic, atomic orbitals of your sample, and they're going to experience um, a loss of energy, sorry. And uh, that loss of energy is gonna cause this incident electron beam to be uh, scattered. So it's gonna change its momentum. And um, so that's why you have uh, a little bit of a 
angle to this uh, uh, emitted beam. And so, but due to, you know, the quantized orbital energies, uh, the amount of energy that this primary electron has lost is going to be characteristic to the uh, electron that it interacted with in the uh, atom, your samples in your, the, sorry, the atoms in your sample. And so that's very useful in that we can um, collect these electrons and uh, spread them out in our to our spectrometer and look at the the energy uh, range or the energy plot. And so it's very similar to you know a light spectrometer in which you use a prism to uh, disperse uh, your your uh, sorry your radiation by energy, but um, instead of using a prism, a glass prism, we use a magnets, a magnetic prism to disperse the energy. And so this is just one thing I just want to point out is that, um, yeah, conservation laws, you know, you have a, a change in momentum. So you have an angle of scattering right here. And so it's called, this is called the scattering semi-angle. And then you have uh, the total solid angle of scattering here. And so if you take the integral of this region and you integrate over this whole area, it can give you the scattering cross section. So this, when an electron interacts with an atom, you'll generate signals uh, that can be scattered at an angle that uh, can be described by the scattering cross-section. So this is very uh, useful to know uh, when you want to do quantification of your materials. So just to note that, um, and then we'll come back to it in a little bit. So, okay. Uh, and uh, here, uh, what is very important is that when you are collecting electrons that have scattered to a certain angle, um, you want to make sure that you're going to collect um, that signal. And so, uh, as I showed here, you know, you have your inelastically scattered electrons, but you also have elastic scattering. So they're scattered, scattered to a, a lot larger uh, angle. And um, one thing that we can do to kind of eliminate contribution uh, from those signals is to have an entrance aperture shown here, uh, which is actually placed, you know, towards the top of the GIF or your spectrometer. And so uh, this is very important. Uh, you want to know, you know, how how much uh, signal am I collecting? And it's uh, you can change, you know, the I guess the area of like collection by doing things like changing your uh, camera length and um, changing your convergence angle. But uh, you want to just make sure that you're collecting a lot of signals. So that's also an advantage over EDS is that you're collecting, since these are forward scattered, you're, you're collecting um, a lot of these electrons that are generated or the signals that are generated and it's going straight into the spectrometer. So as opposed to, you know, EDS system where you are generating uh, signals, you know, that are all around or em are emitted from, you know, all angles from your sample, but your detector, your EDS's detector is, you know, is positioned at a certain angle. So you are collecting, you know, less, like about 1% of the total signal, as opposed to EELS, where you're collecting, you know, 40% uh, of the signal that's generated. So it's a lot, uh, that, that does a lot, it's helpful for detecting, you know, uh, trace elements and things like that. So um, once it goes through the spectrometer, the or the inorganic, oh, sorry, not inorganic, the inelastically scattered electrons uh, enter the spectrometer. Uh, it goes through the magnetic prism and um, it's magnified, and then you can actually view the dispersion here. So this is the result um, at the 
uh, detector, which is probably either your CCD, CMOS, or your direct electron detector. And all the spectra, all spectra has uh, these general characteristics. So you have your zero loss peak here, and you have your low loss region here, and your core loss region here. So as you can see, uh, this is counts by you know energy loss, so an EV. So you'll just you'll notice that uh, the ZLP or the zero loss peak has is the most intense signal, followed by the plasma peak, and then lastly the core loss region, um, which is a very tiny signal, but is actually you can get a lot of information from it. So just something to note. So first, before we talk about, you know, details of the spectra, let's first talk about how we generate the, the inelastically scattered electrons and how we detect them. So the very important uh, part of this technique is to have a spectrometer uh, shown here. And so what I'm showing you right now is a post column uh, filter. So that is where it's placed at the end of your TEM. Um, there's another one where it could be placed uh, between your sample and your viewing screen. screen. But those uh, spectrometers, I would say, I have never seen one. They are in, they're used um, in Joel microscopes um, and produced by Zeiss. So. Oh, and there's also uh, neon uh, ones as well, but uh, I would say the most popular one um, that you'll find or probably encounter is the pulse column filter. So let's just talk a little bit about that. So um, this is the uh, pulse column filter is produced by Gatan or manufactured by Gatan. Um, and uh, they, have um, several generations out. Uh, the latest one is the continuum, uh, which also can be equipped with the K3 electron detector, direct electron detector. And so how this works is that you have your elect uh, inelastically scattered electrons. Um, you're going to collect that into, it's going to go into the detector. Um, you, you have uh, your magnetic prism that's going to disperse uh, the uh, electrons by their energies. And uh, you have several uh, dodecapoles uh, shown here. So you have a total of eight that's shown in this figure. Um, and then you have, so a couple of them are used uh, for just um, focusing the spectra, making sure that uh, you have good uh, energy resolution, and then you have projection lenses to project that onto your detector. And um, lastly, you have your electrostatic de uh, deflector, which is um, referred to, commonly referred to as dual eels. So this is a very uh, helpful um, addition onto the spectrometer. Um, it's very useful for collecting or acquiring the zero loss peak uh, along with your spectra. So if you ever find uh, a spectrometer that has dual eels, you know, you should use it every, every single time you acquire some data. And we can talk a little bit about that and why uh, it's useful in a little bit. So I just want to touch a little bit on, uh, about the detectors um, that you can have that are equipped onto the spectrometers. So there are two types of detectors. One is the inner indirect electron detector, oh sorry, indirect detector, and then you have uh, direct detection of the electrons. And so, you know, these uh, are probably a lot more common and installs. And so uh, they're just, you know, CMOS or CCD uh, detectors. And so um, generally how they work is that you have, you know, an electron that comes down, you have a scintillator that 
yeah, that uh, generates photons. And then these photons travel down a fiber optics onto the detector uh, by generating, you know, these electron hole pairs and that generation signal and it goes into um, the computer and to, to be digitized. And so one disadvantage of this kind of detector is that you'll see, you know, for one electron, you can get, you know, generate 60 uh, signals. I guess you would say so you kind of like decrease um, your resolution, your spectral resolution, when you uh, uh, have this detector equivalent to your spectrometer. But um, they have recently, or I, I guess it's not so recently, but they have come out with a direct detection, a uh, direct electron detector. And so this is basically a back bend uh, CMOS detector. So it just basically takes the electron and uses that as a signal directly. So this electron will generate the electron hole pair. So one electron hole pair, about one is generated uh, for and um, goes to the detector. So it's uh, your point spread function is greatly um, improved. And so it improves your signal to noise ratio and your energy resolution. Um, so acquisition modes for uh, for EOS is that um, you can use them as either in the energy filtered mode, so FTEM, or as a STEM SI. So uh, at Sorry. So for FTEM, um, that's when basically you have a parallel beam or a CTEM, or a, you know, your regular TEM uh, beam. Uh, and then the other option is to have a convergent uh, probe. So, so you have a uh, so STEM, sorry, as shown here. Uh, so they both acquire uh, EELS data but just the modes are a little bit different. And so what is shown here are these data cubes, and this is uh, what is uh, collected. So the thing with uh, FTEM is that you have your spectra as shown here. And what you can do is that uh, with FTEM in the, in the spectrometer, you have this energy selecting slit. And so what that does is going to is going to select a certain uh, you know energy range uh, of your spectra and take an image, and so it's just an energy filtered image collected for a certain uh, energy uh, range. Um, it's very helpful for this uh, generating zero loss images, uh, also uh, imaging for examples in which you have a decrease in uh, contrast, image contrast. You can also perform elemental mapping um, and your energy resolution is more so dependent on the width of the slit rather than your detector. And uh, it also uh, requires a longer acquisition time. So, if you can kind of see here, you know, you're just acquiring an uh, XY image for every uh, energy range that you uh, choose. So you collect one here, and then you can move the slit or the drip tube, and it's going to collect another image, and so on. Um, but what is more, I guess, common, I would say, is using the collecting EELS data using a STEM probe. And that's where you're just rastering this, your probe across your sample specimen. And the signal is just collected. Your, this, the EELS signal is collected. And um, so what you're doing is that, say your probe is here in this position, you're gonna collect a spectra and then move on to the next position and collect a spectra, move to the next one and collect a spectra. So you're rastering and as you're rastering you're collecting spectra and um you it's it's uh 
pretty advantageous because you you can uh, use the um, a very fine probe to get spatially resolved, you know, inf uh, spectral information. So I would say that you know you can also get elemental mapping, and um, your uh, energy resolution is dependent more so on the detector and maybe then um, versus the slit. So you're not using a slit in SI, and then uh, an advantage is that also you have shorter acquisition times. <clears throat> so here's just one example. I'm not going to go much uh, into FTEM. Um, we're going to go more into STEM, as this is uh, really common, the most common technique. But it is useful. So say, you know, you have you you're want to acquire, you know, TM images, and you have poor contrast. So say you have something that contains a lot of carbon, or it's very thick. Um, you might want to try uh, zero loss imaging. And so if you can find uh, a spectrometer that's, so a GIF that uh, has, you know, this image mode, so FTEM acquisition, um, it can greatly uh, help you uh, get better uh, image contrast. So here is shown of an unfiltered image versus a, filt a filtered image. So that's where you basically collect uh, an image of just this region here. So you uh, eliminate all of the inelastically scattered electrons. You kind of generate just this um, image with electrons that have not lost any energy. So it's pretty helpful. Um, so energy resolution and dispersion. This is a uh, Good to touch upon. So, one advantage, as I said, with EOS is that you have really good energy resolution, and that's due to the spectrometer. But you also want to think about, you know, if you have a really good spectrometer, what good is it if you have, you know, not a not good electron source? So, things to think about um, when you want to acquire EOS is. You know, what, what kind of electron source do I have and what kind of energy resolution can I get with that? So, um, first, okay, let's just go a little bit backwards. So, your energy resolution can be measured uh, with your zero loss peak, which is I have here. Um, so, we have, it's basically, this is a little bit out, but, um, Basically, you're just going to look at, you can see, you know, you have your electron source. So your electron source has, you know, that's gonna, it's gonna produce your electrons that don't have a uniform energy. You know, it's 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 made, some, some sources are made such that you have higher, uh, it emits uh, less broad energy beam. But the uh, but let mm, me think about this. So that's going to affect your spectra, uh, spectra, right? So, for example, uh, let's see. For the if you have a source that doesn't have good energy resolution, you're not going to be able to resolve uh, certain peaks in your spectra, right? And um, one thing is that you kind of want to look for a TEM that has a FEG on it so that you can actually uh, resolve uh, the fine structure in the peaks. But also, um, you can also use a monochromator. So that's going to be uh, an energy filter placed at the top of your TEM. And so basically it uh, filters, you know, the source beam. So it helps you isolate electrons of certain, uh, a smaller uh, energy spread. 
and it helps to uh, increase your energy resolution of your spectra. And so what we have here is that when you have a monochromator, you know, you, you select, you know, a window of source beam electrons with, you know, window of, a, of energy, a smaller window of energy. You turn on them, you have the monochromator and uh, you can see that your uh, resolution, so it uh, increases or sorry, so it's measured by the full, full width half max or your bandwidth. And so you have a much tighter uh, ZLP here. So shown by, you know, this really thin peak here. And that's very helpful. So when you have that, you know, you can resolve your, when your energy resolution increases, you can resolve peaks a lot better. Um, so when you have energy resolution, uh, you, you're trying to resolve, you know, fine structure within your peaks. And so one thing to point out is that in your spectrometer, you have uh, what is called energy dispersion. So it's just um, just as in the spectrum between electrons differing, differing in energy. So say uh, you have your zero loss peak here. It's just um, how many channels that you're going to have be uh, between two peaks. So, say uh, if you move, this is a good example if you have your zero loss peak or how to measure your dispersion. So, you have uh, your zero loss peak in one position, and you say, okay, let's move, let's change the drip tube by 10 EVs, and we're going to put the peak here. And so, you, then you can count how many you know, pixels on your detector are between these two peaks and that can, um, you know, increase like your resolution. So like trying to, um, to say, you know, if these peaks are separated by just a few EV, you wanna make sure that you can actually capture that. So same thing with image resolution, right? You want to capture, um, have good peak intensities. So, and resolve them. So uh, you want to, if you want to have, like say, look at the fine structure of your spectra, you want to have a large dispersion, which actually means you have a small uh, EV per channel. So say, you know, 0 0.01 EV per channel. So each pixel is gonna be assigned to 0.1 EV. And the result is that you get a very small energy window. Um, so as opposed to a small dispersion in which you have a very large EV per channel. So that means that um, a small dispersion means that you can uh, have, so say, say a small dispersion is like one EV per channel. That means if your detector is 20, 20 48 pixels by 20, 40 pixels, you're gonna have an energy window that is 2048 EV wide. And so that allows you to acquire uh, information from a large uh, energy range, but you're gonna have a decrease in your, uh, the energy resolution of your spectra. So it's just something to think about uh, when you wanna acquire yields is, you know, what kind of dispersion do I need? Um, am I looking for peak shifts and do I need to resolve? Do I really need? Do I really need a good energy resolution to resolve uh, the peaks that I would like to resolve? So, um, and this is all done in the spectrometer. Uh, another thing to improve your energy resolution is uh, by using, you know, knowing what kind of detectors you have. So, as I said, you know, you have these direct electron detectors and your indirect electron detectors. And so this is just a paper that's just talking about the direct electron detectors uh, published by Catan. And basically it's just showing that with a direct electron detector, your energy resolution, uh, you have a really improved energy resolution. So it's zero loss peak, the width is greatly reduced. Um, it can resolve, you know, the zero loss peak or confine it to just a few pixels, uh, while uh, the indirect detectors is going to 
have the larger or a wider decrease in energy resolution, right? Sorry. And uh, also just showing as a function of dispersion. So advantages of having, uh, as I said, an increased energy resolution is that you can resolve, you know, features in your spectra a lot better. So, for example, these are all indirect uh, signals versus the direct electron detector signal up here. So, as you can see with a large, oh, sorry, a smaller dispersion, 0.5 BV per channel versus 0.125 BV per channel, um, you can actually resolve the peaks a lot better um, than if you were to use a larger dispersion on an indirect electron detector. So it's greatly advantageous if you want to do fine structure analysis of your spectra, but um, if you want to just, you know, get just general elemental information, distribution of elements with your user sample, um, using a indirect CCD or CMOS detector is just fine. And actually, I would say, I mean, the, the detector that we have on our Continuum S is it's not bad. It's pretty good. So, okay, so that's a little bit about the spectrometer. So now let's just kind of talk about the spectrum itself and what kind of information that you can get from it. So I'm going to break it down by the regions of the spectra. So first is, you know, your ZLP, which is referred to, as I said, your zero loss peak. And so it's just referred to the peak. The most intense peak, which occurs at zero EV. So these are electrons that have not experienced any um, change in energy. So, for example, like electrons that have just, you know, gone through your sample. So these electrons are very fast. A lot of them are going to go straight through your sample um, and experience have no interactions with your sample. So that's why this peak is so intense. So the, uh, but it's very useful. So for measuring specimen thickness and you can use it for energy reference. So even though these elect electrons have, you know, experienced no loss in energy, they're very useful to acquire. So it's good reference to acquire and can also measure your thickness. So I would say, you know, whenever you're acquiring eels, it's very important to just kind of to acquire the zero loss peak if possible, if you have the dual eels and you're looking at core loss, for example. Um, so this is where, as I said, you know, the zero loss peak is where you can measure the resolution, the energy resolution, and um, using the bandwidth of this peak. And so, before I guess we go on, so we talk about um, inelastic collisions. And so, that's where the, you know the electron, the primary or your source electron travels through your sample, and it's gonna go to the spectrometer. And so, what is very important is that you have to make sure that your sample is thick enough um, to or sorry, thin enough for the electrons to uh, transmit through your sample. So um, that's gonna be modeled. Uh, so uh, shown here, so your inelastic collisions, uh, we can say that they are independent events. So it's gonna follow this Poisson statistics. And so basically it's just saying that, <clears throat> it's just shown here, this is the equation, where you have T is your sample thickness, you have your mean free path, um, which is just the average distance between the collisions. And then you have uh, your integrated intensity for the scattering, and then your total integrate, uh, integrated intensity. And so from this, uh, we say that the zero loss peak, so electrons in the zero loss peak have uh, encountered no, uh, collisions, no inelastic collisions, we can rearrange this, so our n will be zero. We can rearrange this and use this equation to measure the thickness of our sample. So in the case of no scattering events um, for the ZLP, 
um, our thickness or T over lambda is going to be just to rearrange this equation a little bit to this. And so we can use this to uh, measure, you know, uh, sample thickness. And so this is uh, referred to as a ratio lock technique in which you basically just take the integrated intensity of the zero loss peak uh, to the integrated intensity of the entire spectrum and then take the natural log of that, negative natural log of that, and that's your T over lambda. And um, so this is probably the first thing that should be done in when you wanna start your uh, experiment is that you want to make sure that you have a very thin sample. So the number one limitation in eels is sample thickness. So that's just because uh, as your um, electrons travel through, uh, you know, more material, you're going to have an increase in scattering events. And um, as a result, you have generation of these multiple plasma um, peaks in your spectra. So, for example, as shown here, and uh, you for a very thin sample, so your T over lambda is 0 0.2, you see your uh, first uh, plasma peak shown here, and then your, the rest of your spectra looks you know, okay, but for a very thick sample, you have many, many, you know, interactions and you have generation of, you know, you can see your second and third order um, or third plasmons and so peaks. So uh, it tends to, you know, decrease your energy resolution. It's harder, it makes it harder to uh, resolve, you know, single scattering events. So uh, as shown here, you know, as you're, thickness increases, you know, you have a lot of contribution uh, from these plasmons and it just kind of just washes out your single scattered electron signal. And it's just kind of described a little bit more here in which you have, you know, your ionization edge, your single scattered electron. Uh, this spectra is convolved with the low loss so the plural scattering here. And the result is, you know, something that looks like the shaded region. But there are ways to kind of uh, improve this or kind of remedy this. If you do have a thick sample, is that you can uh, perform a deconvolution on your spectra. So you you have to acquire have to have your zero loss peak in your spectra. You're gonna um, remove that from your spectra and then you can actually kind of improve um, the resolution of this peak um, but it doesn't you know kind of it's still I would say that you should still try to always have a very thin sample so that you can um, don't have to kind of deal with this you know muddled um, signal it's a lot easier if you have a lot if you have a thinner sample. So here's just an example of when you have another example, I guess, before and after deconvolution. So you can see that, you know, you have, it looks like you have a, you know, a lot of intensity here, but actually that was just generated from, from uh, plasmons. And so, or, or, or sorry, uh, plural scattering. So you have a, uh, increase you know you you can resolve these uh k edge a lot better and again with boron um and nitrogen peaks so uh you have your before you can kind of see evidence of them here but after deconvolution um you see that it's greatly uh increased so the you know you can resolve these peaks a lot better so deconvolution is very I guess important and it should always kind of be done, but just uh, especially if you want to do quantification. So just to know, you know, if you want to quantify um, certain elements in your sample, you want to keep your T over lambda less than one. If you want to just do elemental mapping, um, you can have 
it up to two, but I usually usually just want to keep it under one. So if you have a dual yields, a, a spectrometer with dual yields, I would highly recommend that you uh, acquire the zero loss peak, or even if you don't have one, just acquire the zero loss peak first. And so you can ensure, you know, measure your sample thickness, you know, is this region of interest um, good for eels? If so, then you can perform further analysis on it. And, you know, acquiring the zero loss peak is really fast. You know, if you're, it can, it can just be a few seconds and you can already just see uh, the thickness of your sample or your region of interest. Okay. So the next part of the spectra is your low loss region. And that's just generated from outer shell electrons that undergone um, that have interacted with their incident electron beam. So they are just weakly bound or conduction or valence electrons. Um, and is uh, where so this zero loss region usually occurs between zero or defined as you know between zero and around 50 eV. So it contains, you know, your plasmon peak. You also have uh, inner band transitions. And then from this region, you can um, extract out, you know, information about optical properties. Uh, you get your dielectric constants, uh, look at the band gap, and, uh, you know, alloy composition and phase identification. Um, so this region is the second most, you know, intense uh, region of your spectra. Um, and uh, just know if you want to do any kind of analysis in this region, it, it requires a uh, really good energy resolution because a lot of peaks in here, um, there's multiple peaks um, that are generated. You know, it's very easy to excite these uh, weakly, weak, weakly bound electrons. And so, um, it's very important that you want to have a good electron source, such as a FEG or a cold FEG. You want to choose a dispersion, uh, a very, let's, you know, point, like I would say 0 0.50, like 0 0.03 EV per channel or less. Um, and most always you're going to use a monarch commuter if you want to do any kind of um, analysis for uh, this region of the spectra. <clears throat> so um, you're able to one one you know kind of general I would say uh, analysis is just looking at the plasma energy. So this really intense peak here. So you you always have this near spectra, and it's defined here. And so it's just the number of conduction slash valence electron density. Um, to E square, which is your electron hole charge, and times um, constant divided by pi over m, which is your uh, mass. So you can use this uh, to kind of estimate, or from this, from that, you can estimate, you know, all these kinds of things, and you most likely see be used, you know, to look at the shifts, you can look at the shifts of these, uh, this plasma peak here. So lots of times it can tell you, you know, um, things like bound states or alloys, um, different types of materials. Uh, you have a little bit of a peak shift because you're just, you know, changing. There's a little bit of difference in these weakly bound electrons, energies of these weakly bound electrons. So you can actually probe that a little bit. Um, that's like the kind of general easiest uh, extraction that you can do from this. The other ones are a little bit more complex in which you're going to use like a monarch meter. Um, so, uh, and, you know, an example is where you can just look at um, the, uh, the plasmons of certain uh, materials generated. So. Uh, for 
in this example, you have nanophotonics um, that exploit the eigenmodes uh, for certain nanoparticle shapes. And so you can see here with the stem probe, you know, you can actually probe regions of this 50 nanometer particle and just look at like the uh, the optical properties of it. So uh, it's just one kind of technique. Um, but most often we kind of probe the core loss region, uh, which is the region of the spectra that's uh, 100 EV and greater shown here. And that's um, where the incident electron beam have interacted with your inner initial electrons or your uh, your um, sorry not your valence but your your core shell electrons and uh, it's very useful so to um, for quantification also it can be used for element element ident identification these are the most two common uh, uses. Um, you can also look at the uh, fine structure to look at the chemical to extract out chemical state information, oxidation states, and then you can also probe uh, the local environment. So uh, if you have, you know, an, an atom that had an electron that lost some energy, you're gonna. Well, well, I'll explain a little bit where you can, you know, kind of gather information from nearby atoms. So as I, you know, as I said, this is like the most common uh, region of the spectrum that is used. Um, you can generate, you know, elemental maps. And um, they, you, it's one advantage of using a stem probe is that, you know, you can um, get to generate these elemental maps at very high spatial resolution. So if you have a really good stem probe, you can even probe, uh, you know, a, a atomic columns to look at, you know, your element distribution uh, within your material. So, um, so for example, like this is just uh, crystal, lanthanum, nickel, and they want to look at the distribution of nickel and lanthanum. Uh, it's a very, I think, I think later I'll talk about this, but um, there, there are also peaks that are very close to one another. So it's um, they were able to just resolve uh, that spectrum and produce a map that actually gave you uh, um, spatial information of the elements. And um, but most commonly, you have you know these elemental maps that are produced. Um, and yeah, you can they you can all, probe all. Almost all of the uh, electrons, or sorry, elements, uh, along, along the periodic table. So, just a little bit more about the peak shapes, the shapes of these peaks that are generated in the core loss region. So, they can have uh, different shapes, and that kind of tells you uh, different information. So, just first of all, just the shapes you have a sawtooth shape. Here, which you have, you know, a very sharp uh, peak here, and then it kind of tapers off down. You have white lines here, where you have, you know, these L, two and three peaks usually, and so they're usually uh, for that you'll usually see them for, you know, 4D elements or rare earth uh, elements. Um, you have this delayed signal, so. This is your third and fourth period uh, elements, and then also your fifth period elements. And then you also have this plasmon like uh, shape, um, which is your fourth period elements. Oh, wow. And then um, you also have mixed. So, and then, um, so what you can use for this core loss, as I said, is that you can look at, um, you get chemical information, oxidation state information. Um, so, there, so the core loss uh, edges, the ionization edges can be separated um, into two, categorized into two um, kind of regions. So we have the 
uh, electron loss near edge structure. So that's defined, you know, within 50 EV from the ionization edge. Um, normally, you can do things like chemical fingerprinting. So, you know, as you see for this carbon K edge um, for diamond, for graphite, uh, you know, amorphous carbon, certain different carbon materials can have uh, different peak shapes depending on, you know, the, uh, the chemical state of them. So, say, you know, what, what it's bound to. Um, also, these uh, intensities, the peak shapes, can give you information of the unoccupied states, so um, or the uh, anti-bonding orbitals. So, for example, a lot of these metals um, have very uh, have empty d orbitals, and so uh, you know lower lying electrons can be excited up into those uh, states. But um, so that is how you have these really sharp peaks here. But um, something for like copper, where you have uh, build D electrons uh, shells, so D10, um, there's no uh, electrons that can be excited up into those regions. And so you kind of don't see those characteristic white lines for copper. Um, and so that's uh, kind of tells you right away, can kind of tell you what kind of oxidation that you have. Um, but if you want to do a little bit more in-depth analysis um, of that, uh, you can look at the peak ratios. Um, so this L3, L2, I should really speed it up a little. Okay. And then you can also probe uh, local orbital density. So just looking at the different transitions and the peak shapes can give you uh, information about, you know, the unbound uh, orbitals, electron orbitals. So um, and this is your extended energy fine structure. Uh, this is just probes, you know, nearby atoms. It's a very uh, intense, intensive technique. Um, so you need, uh, once you have your data, you have to actually fit it to a model to actually get some meaningful information from it. Um, it's very similar to uh, Extended, oh yeah, 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 uh, X-ray uh, absorption, uh, the extended fine structure of the uh, X-ray absorption spectra is produced in the same way and interpreted in the same way. And so it can give you information about the distance of the nearby scattering atoms, on the number of the scattering atoms, on like the, the identification of this atom that, that's nearby. Um, but it's not, it's a very intensive technique. Normally we just kind of do um, this illness and just regular ionization ed edges. Um, so one important thing is that once you have your spectra, you want to do a background fitting. Um, so a lot of, you know, you're collecting signal that is um, inelastically scattered electrons, but you also have a contribution to your signals uh, from other, you know, regions. And so you want to fit, you want to get extract out just the intensity from your inelastically scattered um, electrons. And so the most common fit is uh, the power law. And so this can vary uh, with thickness, you know, your collection angle and your uh, energy loss, you know, regions of the spectrum that you're going to uh, pick. So, but basically you want to just kind of fit the background region that's like uh, a region before the ionization edge and the ex it's going to be subtracted from the raw spectra and then you can get your actual uh, encounter intensity for the inelastically scattered electrons. Um, just some tips is that your window should be 5 EV from the edge onset, so shown here. Um, you kind of want this to be as wide as possible. You want this background to just, you know, kind of seem like it fits the spectra, the rest of the spectra nicely. Um, so it should be, you know, at most 30% of the edge energy. And uh, you want to have your fit region, uh, so this region right here, to uh, 10 to 30% of the edge onset. And um, one helpful thing also is that, uh, you can, 
if you have if you're interested in uh, elements or ionization edges that are very uh, that are nearby one another, you'll have to do this multilinear least squares fitting, um, which is easily done in Gatan. And so it basically you just take um, you're just uh, extracting out the spectra here. So for example, this is nickel right here, and then you have copper. And so you can see that these peaks are very close to one another. It's very hard to fit a background to them. You know, you can see the background uh, shown in red is not fit very well. And so uh, then that's when you can use this MLLS to uh, extract out this copper signal. And so basically it's just, you know, assuming that both of these spectra the intensity here is an addition is intensity from or contribution from the nickel and from the copper and then they're kind of added together here so um, it's easily done in gms you just choose this um, say that this peak overlaps and it can perform that for you so now you can see that you know nearby ionization edges are fit a lot better Okay, so let me just uh, kind of skip that. You just, this is just for quantification. Um, these peaks are not very, it's just for when you want to uh, fit your uh, background and your, uh, your, sorry, sample window. Uh, so you kind of just, as a summary, you don't want to include uh, illness, uh, uh, this illness region in your uh, intensities uh, because it's not it's just not modeled very well. You can see here, um, it's not modeled very well for uh, this region, and uh, you don't want to use this for quantification. And uh, so, just a summary, you can um, kind of do to you know, uh, quantify your signals in two ways. Um, you can get the relative quantification or the absolute quantification. Um, basically, relative qu quantification is where you're looking at the uh, ratio of the integrated intensities for certain uh, regions of interest or ionization edges of interest. You just look at, you just take the integrated intensities and you can kind of compare them one to another. Um, but if you would like to do absolute quantification, um, you can do that. Um, but you're, uh, you should account for plural scattering as some of the intensity or the counts that you'll have is uh, contributions from the uh, uh, plural scattering. And so to do that, you'll need to know the partial cross-section, the scattering cross-section. Oh gosh, this is I'm sorry, this is gonna run a little bit behind, but I think this is uh, some of the more nitty gritty kind of things. So the scattering, um, so determine uh, the scattering cross sections. Um, basically here's your general kind of, your scattering uh, uh, cross section is just related to this angle of scattering here. And so you can kind of see that um, your, uh, Sorry, your scattering angle for the edge. So, and then your uh, scattering angle here for it. So the characteristic scattering for a certain uh, edge and then just the scattering angle. Um, and that can be uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, defined or resolved or measured um, by changing the collection angle. And so um, basically you just want to make sure that you're collecting, you know, inelastically scattered electrons without um, a lot of contribution, not increasing your spectral background. So basically you just want to make sure that um, you have a good uh, entrance into your apertures. So you have a good collection angle. This is very important, you know, for quantification. Um, it's also, a good way to, you know, maximize your signal to noise ratio. So basically you kind of want a general rule is that you want your collection angle to be uh, two or three or just like larger than your convergence angle um, or two to three uh, times larger than the characteristic scattering angle of a certain element of interest. 
Um, so if you have a GIF, uh, you, just, you can easily measure that uh, in F10 mode. So basically, you just want your diffraction to disk um, in your aperture. Uh, you don't want to have the size of your disk a lot larger than your aperture or a lot smaller than your aperture. You can um, either collect too much signal, have too much background, or um, not collect enough signal. And like here, you're, you're probably not going to collect enough sig signal. You're losing some of those uh, uh, inelastically scattered electrons is being cut off by the aperture. So it's just very important that you want to uh, align your beam, transmitted beam into the spectrometer nicely. Okay, so basically for setting up big experiments, um, things you want to just consider is that, you know, is my sample thin enough? Um, do I, what is my electron source? You know, what kind of en energy resolution do I need? And what elements am I looking for? So kind of have that in mind when you're setting up an EOS experiment. And then from there, you can kind of uh, go on to actually conduct the experiment. Um, you're gonna, you know, set up your column, set up your uh, stem probe to whatever spatial resolution that you need. You're gonna tune the spectrometer, you're gonna choose your energy dispersion, and then first, and then you know, very important, measure your thickness. Um, so just some helpful tips is that you know, when you're um, scanning, uh, generating your, your spectrum image, um, if you would like to get a really high spatial resolution um, map, you wanna just kind of consider um, your exposure time. So if you decrease you know, your pixel time, you're going to be scanning the probe, you're going to be inputting, it's going to scan a lot slower, right? So you're going to putting, you're going to be putting a lot of um, energy into your sample. You can uh, induce uh, damage uh, to your sample like that. Um, you should always take advantage of dual yields to collect a zero loss peak. Um, it's good, you know, you can always align your spectra to the zero loss peak or you can measure the thickness. Um, don't forget to take your dark and gain references. Um, so you want to make sure that your that your any any you know changes in intensity is truly arising um, from your sample and not any you know defects in your camera or your detector. Uh, and just you know always note that when you have um, when you're using a stem probe or using stem SI. Um, your sample is very is more prone to contamination. So, just something to think about when you're trying to acquire eels is that you know how fast uh, can you go? Or also, you know, if if I'm building up carbon, you're increasing the thickness of your region that it's probed as well at the same time. So you can um, decrease uh, your you know it makes it hard to resolve certain peaks in your spectra, and then also uh, sample drift. So, especially with STEM, uh, while you're scanning or rastering uh, the probe uh, across your sample, um, you're not taking, you know, it's going from the top. You, you have a region, you're just going from the top of your, of your, you know, uh, your, I guess it's your survey or your uh, region that you're going to uh, collect spectra from is going to go like this. So if your if your um, sample drifts while it's scanning and collecting data, you're going to see that uh, in your spectra. So GMS has a very helpful uh, kind of function. It's called the spectrum drift function. Um, but it's, it's just the drifts where you can actually realign uh, the sample going to realign a uh, sample and uh, so that you can actually collect your your spectra is going to align with you know your x y image adf image so that's about it um thank you for listening um now I'll just take any questions thanks that was a brief in introduction to eels great thanks natalie uh so there's a few questions that have come in so the first one is it possible to detect trace amounts of light atoms like carbon and nitrogen in eels? What limitations are there with eels? Yeah, you can definitely uh, detect. So it's 0 0.01, um, you know, detection limit. Um, you can detect it. It just depends on like what your, I guess, your matrix is and, you know, where that peak is going to come from. 
where it's going to be placed. Um, so it's definitely possible. You can do things like deconvolution to improve uh, your spectra um, and things like that. It, uh, I've looked at recently I looked at trace boron. That was very difficult. So it's close to uh, you know carbon and nitrogen. I really had to use a lot of current and um, have a lot a lot uh, longer aqua, uh, exposure time. Um, luckily, the sample did not damage, so that was good. Took a lot. You'd also want to, you know, kind of uh, have a large collection angle, so you make sure that you know you collected as much signal as you can get. Um, we had like we set it to like the lowest, the smallest, you know, camera length, so we had the you know biggest collection angle that we can get. But things like that, just try to change your current, your collection angle, um, and your exposure time and tries to several different ways or change certain different different parameters until you actually see that no yeah great next question uh a large dispersion like one ev per channel gives you the biggest field of view the largest window that is the opposite of what you said so just a clarification on what you call large or small dispersion Okay. Uh, I, sometimes I just like say things and I don't, they just kind of come out of my mouth and I don't really uh, know. So, yeah, <laughs> thank you. But now, like, can I clarify is one EV per channel a large dispersion or is 0.1 EV per channel a large dispersion? Can you just clarify? Oh, which sorry. Ones you're asking for large no, uh, one EV per channel is a small dispersion. Is the opposite. So a small dispersion is one EV per channel. You have a very large energy window, so you can probe, you know, greater, especially with a new, uh, uh, sorry, the continuum. You can have, you know, a three thousand EV window, and that's with a small dispersion. Okay. Uh, next question. In EDX, some characteristic peaks may overlap. Is this possible in EELS? Yes, definitely. And so that's when you're going to just use MLS bidding uh, to try to separate those two uh, peaks out, the intensities from those two peaks to actually collect, you know, a valid or get valid information. Um, there are other ways, you know, to do that. Um, but mainly MLS is the main uh, way to, to separate uh, overlapping peaks. Okay, so, that's yeah. all the questions. Okay, oh, do you want to add more? No, I was going to say EELS, the EELS.info uh, website has a lot of information about, you know, uh, peak fitting and things like that. So post vector processing. Because there's a lot of, uh, you can do PCA, you can do different things, um, but I feel like it's just uh, introduction is just, there's a lot of things to go over. I, yeah, you can probably have a whole lecture just on data processing. Actually, you can have multiple lectures on data processing. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like yeah. Natalie mentioned, this is our intro, so we will be having more webinars in the future of specific signals and uh, data collection and uh, post-processing techniques.